natural outlaw of Josie Wells, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Man, you, you brought up the uh, my favorite subject, the okay. stuff you stink at. All right, Mr. Jeff, are you ready? I am. Ty, you ready? Giddy up. All right, let's have some fun. Time out, Tyler. Who are we taking a time out with today? Kevin, looking sharp in the blazer today, man. Uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, of course, children of all ages. Today we have Jeff Sinzebox, president at EPI, empowering people's independence. Jeff, thanks for being on the show. It looks like you're over there in Henrietta. But first, I'm going to start off with one question. If you could star in any movie and take the lead role, what lead role would it be in what movie and why? Man, that's a good question. Um, I would probably do probably uh, one of the old Clint Eastwood Westerns, one of the spaghetti Westerns, because uh, I think Clint is like the coolest guy on the planet and I am not. So to just, and I am a person of too many words and he's a man of few words in those things. So I, I got some things I could learn. <laughs> it makes memorizing those lines a little easier too. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, man, I love it. All right, so so we got uh, we're, we're riding on our horses, and uh, there happens to be a radio station just dialed in to Jeff's favorite song. What song, if you had to listen to one song, Jeff, maybe for the rest of your life, what song are you picking? Um, I'd probably pick the song Twenty One Twelve by Rush. Uh, one because it's a twenty one minute long song, so that I wouldn't get bored. I could listen to just parts of it if I wanted to. Uh, it is my favorite band since I've been about 13 years old. I've seen them in concert a bunch of times, and I kind of grew up and grew older with them. So uh, I'd say that would be the song. I love I love the analytical thinking there because 21 minutes, yeah, if you pick the three-minute song, that could get pretty yeah. <laughs> repetitive. I love it. I love it. Good deal. We'll learn, learn a little bit about Jeff here. If we're playing some darts this afternoon over on off the of Henrietta somewhere, mm -hmm. what, if it's us three – Versus mm -hmm. three other people. Who are you inviting to the party, Jeff? Um, can be anybody on the planet. Anyone living, on the or planet. Alive, living or dead. Okay. Uh, I'd say uh, Robin Williams, um, FDR, okay. and uh, uh, let's go with uh, Bob Dylan. What the heck? Ooh. <laughs> All right. I love Bob Dylan. He's got some great lyrics there. He is one of the, my favorite lyricists of all time. That's that's a power trio. I don't like our odds in the in the dark game, Ty, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we might get lost in conversation there for a little while. We always ask a similar question. This time I'm going to ask more of a bumper sticker question. If you could design, create, write your own bumper sticker that you're going to slap on the back of your car that everybody's going to read every time they're passing you or every time you're breaking in front of them, Jeff. What 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 would your bumper sticker read? Justice is worth it. All right. Now I have to ask. You got to explain that. Can you explain that quote to me? Yeah. Well, I guess um, you know. I think that uh, I've always been drawn to things, uh, uh, the discrepancies, the disparities uh, amongst people, and obviously, I'm working with people with disabilities, a very marginalized population of people, and I think it's a lot easier to segregate and congregate away people that are marginalized instead of trying to give them equal footing at the table regardless of what it is and and when you do truly uh, uh include people uh in everything we're all better for it the, when we start limiting to just people that are like us that's the worst of humanity i think well you kind of had a probably better segue into the next section of how you're getting into the work that you're doing today but I couldn't agree more with you. I think a lot of decisions are made and uh, the people are not included within those decisions. And we're surprised that they're not held accountable to the desired outcomes from those decisions and just uh, being engaged through that uh, change management process of sorts. Mm -hmm. um, let's go back because uh, you haven't always been the CEO over empowering people's independence. And I know from past conversations that you and I've had, um, you talk about needing to really have that frontline experience to give you the perspective necessary to focus on how to improve some of these marginalized communities. But first, really understanding the day of life of a frontline employee there at EPI. Can you talk to us about that first job experience and really how that's helped shape um, 
this idea of inclusion, including all at EPI within the decisions of the business? Yeah, I was doing uh, student teaching and took a part-time job working in a group home at a residential agency. It was, you know, student teaching is a full-time job and I had to work my way through school. So I needed money coming in. So I, I took this job. I was connected to who is now my brother's wife. who was his girlfriend at the time. She connected me in and I got in and, and I'd never done any kind of caretaking role before. Uh, I'd never um, I've served people with disabilities, anything like that. And so it was a extremely humbling experience. Uh, you know, you're getting overwhelmed with not just how do I toilet somebody? How do I help somebody with a shower or feed somebody? How do I handle someone who's nonverbal, who's very agitated, but all of the rules and the regulations and the things that go with it. And, and you know, just feeling overwhelmed and untrained in what I was trying to do uh, and wanting to do a really good job. And often, you know, you'd get training after the fact, you do something wrong and then somebody pull you aside and say, let me tell you what you did wrong here and and why you can't do it again kind of thing. So, um, you, you know, and, and I was like 22 years old at the time. So I felt like I knew a lot about the world and knew what I was doing. And it was extremely humbling to kind of open the door to uh, a whole type of work where um, I didn't know what I was doing and and I felt a little lost and I needed help of other people and I've never been good at asking for help from other people. So it was um, it was a lot of things. It was scary and whatever else, but I was just talking to somebody the other day. The first couple months of my work as a frontline employee is burned into my brain. I can smell the smells and see the people and and remember the interactions like they were yesterday there's a whole lot of years in between that are a lot fuzzier in my, in my mind so it really left a, a a really strong impression uh on me i guess for just kind of in the same vein is um you mentioned the disability community um if, yep. if we don't have a family member or a friend uh the average day individual probably doesn't know um, how difficult life can be um but also from an applicant perspective, as some of these employers are now so desperate for talent, I just saw that uh, child labor is up by 70% since 2018 in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and we're still not looking to uh, the disabled community to potentially fit, fit some of these roles and positions because the qualifications are still, you need to be able to carry a 30 pound box. Um, and we're mm -hmm. not really going back to that. How, how has that experience, I mean, did, did that perspective help you to see the opportunities that they too want to be involved in the community just as much as everybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Well, work is a great equalizer, right? Like when, when um, you know, uh, work is a vehicle to which we get a living and, and get connected to people in the community. And, you know, you have unemployment rates for people with disabilities that, that are you know, double digits in numbers higher than the, the regular population consistently. And here we are in a world where we can't find enough staff to do anything. And, and the, you know, people with disabilities, they still have a very high unemployment perspective um, percentage. I haven't seen stats recently, but I'm sure it hasn't gotten much better for people with disabilities. So, uh, you know, and when you don't have that employment, you're you're missing out on the socialization, the feelings of worth, the income, and the game changing. You know, money talks, right? If you're making four hundred thousand dollars a year, you have a lot of choices in life about vehicles you drive, where you live, where you put your kids in school. You know, if you uh, live on Social Security and have Medicaid is health insurance and you know you got 153 bucks a month to spend your choices are very limited in what you can do and who you can connect with and, and those kinds of things so it goes to quality of life it goes to sense of being all of those things absolutely thank jeff and, and can you kind of touch on how empowering people's independence epi uh lends a hand in this yeah, we're we're here as an agency to help people live the life of their choosing. So we serve people with developmental disabilities, epilepsy, and brain injury primarily, um, but a whole host of other disabilities that could go with those things. And really, to not get in the way of an individual, not to drive what they're doing and where they're going, but to ask them what is it that you want in life and help them get there. And and the differentiator or a differentiator for us is. You know, it's really easy to get on board when someone with a disability makes a choice you approve of, like I'm going back to get my GED, but 
But when they make a choice about a, a sexual choice or where they're going to live or something like that, and you don't agree with it, right? That's where a lot of agencies get protective and parental and, and want to like uh, prevent people from doing things. But we learn when we screw things up in life. We learn when we experience rough patches. So we really try to, as an agency, provide um, informed decision making, right? Providing people with information. You want to live out on your own? Great. But you can't go tomorrow unless you have a security deposit and first month's rent. How much money you got on you, right? What are you going to do if you need somebody in the middle of the night? What can we do to work on that right now and get you to where you want to go? So it's not a saying no or maybe someday. It's a let's get working on it today, but but make sure you understand the decision you're making. And if you make a choice and you screw stuff up, guess what? You get treated like everyone else in the world who gets a, an opportunity to choose to learn from it or not, right? So I love it. I love uh, what, how did Melissa word it the other day, Tyler? Uh, learning, learning opportunities. Uh, learning opportunities. Refer yeah. to failure as a learning, learning, learning curve yeah. or learning opportunities. Like, yeah. but I, I want to ask Jeff because it seems like you have the 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 team. The culture has been very customer focused, right? The the mm -hmm. individuals that need these services, and now we're seeing that same customer focus, right? come internally within the organization. And I know you guys have been really working hard as to kind of share some of those best practices that you found externally to work really well and building those relationships and those bonds with that marginalized disabled community to build yep. that trust to actually tell you even what they need. How are you applying that internally at the organization at EPI? Because you guys have also seen a significant amount of growth as well. Are you starting to share some of those best practices from the field and bringing those internally with your own people? Yeah, I would say 30 years ago, uh, my opinions about how to serve people with disabilities haven't changed a ton in 30 years. But 30 years ago, from an employment perspective, I would have been like, get on this train. This is what we're doing or go away. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that isn't the way I see it now. And 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 I've fortunately I've gotten to evolve as I as I progress in my career. And a lot of the same principles, right? Self-determination, being able to be in control of our lives, choice making, these are things that work really well with employees. And and this real, you know, eye-opening thing that happened with us, we did our strategic planning uh, process two years ago, or almost two years ago. And as we're going through it, we put together our strategic plan. There are really five tenants of our strategic plan. And the first two are all about employees. So here we are in a, a human service agency providing services to people with disabilities. And the first two things we're trying to do are addressing the culture, where people are at that are working for us, and the talent. How are they trained and, and, and how do they feel? Because it's really hard to help somebody get a life of their own if maybe you're a victim of domestic violence abuse mm -hmm. or you've never had a good boss and here you are working for someone. How do you get someone to trust their boss? And so it's about meeting those employees where they're at and figuring out a pathway to get the most out of them while they're here. And then providing uh, understanding that, you know, I've been in this field over 30 years and and uh, I'm not done being trained. So how can we get people trained and, and keep that process going, even if they're not going to be in this field forever, even if they want to be a, an electrical engineer someday? What human and interpersonal skills can we teach them while they're here, get the best of them here and benefit them the rest of their life? Can I ask you, was there one singular event that you can trace back in history to change your perspective from everybody get, is getting on this bus and this is the direction that we're going to everybody get on the bus, choose the seat that you think is more aligned with your strengths and your abilities within the organization? Was there one singular moment or was it just a, a, a couple of events that, that helped you to come to that, that realization? I, I think I think it's a combination of things. I think it was a slow evolution over time. Uh, and I got to admit, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So <laughs> as, the labor, as the labor force gets tighter, you start rethinking about what you're looking for in, in folks and in people. But, um, you know, and part of it's maturity, right? Like like you you just, the older I get, the more I realize I don't know. And and so things I used to see as very black and white are more shades of gray. And and so when you do that, it gives you the flexibility to, to treat people all as unique human beings. And it seems kind of weird now to me now that 30, the 30 year ago version of myself would have been like, oh, we're all about people living their best life, but not you employees. Not not that we were yeah. doing that, but 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 
But when you're really taking a look at what matters for people, I mean, the people that work here are feeding their families and developing a sense of self-worth and, and getting through their life with what they're doing here. I don't want people to be miserable uh, you know, while they're, while they're doing this work here. I want them to also be growing and learning uh, and, and moving forward in their lives in a way that, that means something to them. I love it. Yeah. That EX equals uh, customer experience, that employee experience equals customer experience, especially as we evolve more to this service-based model instead of the the 30 year old uh, manufacturing mindset, I think is, is, is kind of what you're touching on there. Ty, mm -hmm. what you got? Love the energy, Jeff, man. I, I just, I knew you would you. love him. Yeah, man, this is easy. Uh, you know, I was just thinking, what, what I is did this? have extra coffee today. So <laughs> good, well, excellent. Good. <laughs> good. Got to bring it, man. And you are, I was going to ask you, what do you think your staff loves most about you? Uh, well, I, I don't know about love, but I, I would say that by staff, I, you know, I, I try to let each uh, employee here, first of all, they have a voice and their voice matters. Uh, no one else's voice is stronger than theirs. And I want people to capitalize on their gifts as a worker in the, in the workplace. So, you know, it's that balance of trying to uh, be consistent and fair um, but also treat people as unique individuals while they're in the workplace. And I think the, the you know, one of the things that, that, uh, about me is I, um, what you see is what you get. So, uh, whether you like it or not, this is pretty much me. You could sit with me having a beer on a Friday night, or I could be in the most formal of settings. You're getting pretty much the same individual. So, um, I, I think that provides assurance to people that work here of, of that I'm not, I don't know, doing something underhanded or sneaky. It's, you know, it's pretty transparent in, in what I do. I love it, Jeff. And I was going to ask you, so how do you kind of like stay green and stay growing? Because you don't strike me as someone who's really concerned about the word retirement. And I never want to <laughs> get there. I, I just, it, it makes me ick, you know? Yeah, yeah. What, what, how do you stay green and growing? Well, you, you know, I think the things that, that weigh you down or get you down, if I think about regulations and, and problems in the workplace and, and the things that are very difficult to deal with, it, it could be very easy. I could understand how that could, could, could wear you down and make you not want to do this kind of uh, work. But when, you know, you look back, you, you stop and take a breath and look back at what you've done. You know, there are people that are alive that wouldn't be alive if I didn't do the things I was doing. There are people that are living a good life because of things that I've done and things that I've helped others do. And I think, you know, I don't think, think I still got more to, to give, right? And, and that I'm not as relevant as I need to be uh, in my role in the workplace. And I hope I have the good sense, if I can use a sports analogy, to be more John Elway and leave on top than Brett Favre, who overstayed his welcome, right? Like, <laughs> like I, I'd rather do that kind of a thing. Yeah, Brady might be added to that mix now, but uh... <laughs> but yes, yes, right? It's too soon. <laughs> yeah, I wanted I wanted to talk about because what you said is kind of your strength and your superpower is is something that I think that we we all look to leaders is sometimes leaders um, their opinions, their thoughts, their emotions seem to change with the breeze. Um, and they're not really comfortable with who they are as a person and as an individual. Yeah. When do you think, Jeff, you found yourself as a person? Was it in maybe that when you were 22 um, and starting to get a, a real life picture as to how others started to live? Is that when you started to do more self-reflection and trying to identify, well, who is Jeff as a person and what do I actually want? When did you figure out who you were as a person? Because you sound... It comes off as confidence, um, yeah. as being, hey, I, you get what you get, um, yeah. but you're also willing to adapt and evolve and change your way of thinking, too. Yeah. I, you know, I think I've always had an, a handle on who I am. I think I've always kind of been a half beat off from other people around me. But I think that the, the switch for me was acceptance. And I think it happened when I got my master's degree. I, when I was going to go to back to school to get my master's degree, I was thinking, well, I should get an MBA. I should get a master's in healthcare administration, something relevant to the thing. And I didn't. I got a master's degree in communications. And I did it because communication is both my greatest asset and it's my greatest weakness as a leader. And so I went back and, and through the process of studying communication theories, really understood a couple of things. And, and one of them is, you know, um, the narrative paradigm, right? I'm a storyteller, naturally. I always have been. And realized that, that, that I 
you know, I lead, I guide by telling examples and stories. And that's how I rally people and persuade people into things. And when I do that, and I, I you know, I did that, that, look at some of those things. And some of the things I'd looked at that my peers do that I stink at, I, I just got to the point is, you know, I'm far enough in life. I'm never going to be that person. I'm not going to be that 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 diplomat, that politician. It's not who I am. And and so when I finished up the school, it was sort of like, why don't I embrace the things I do well and and uh, find other people to help support me with the things I'm not very good at, and and be very open about it. And and so that was probably I don't know 15 years ago. And I think I've been more comfortable in my own skin since going back to school than I have ever been in my whole life. But I think I always kind of knew who I was. I just wasn't comfortable being me uh, for quite a while. Yeah. And I, I'm not, I, I, Tyler and I have shared similar experiences on past shows as well, but mm -hmm. I think, I think that whenever it is, I'm not going to be that person. Um, I think it takes a, a level of confidence to realize that other people are going to continuously to tell you who you need to be or should be. Mm -hmm. Rather than encouraging you to actually truly find yourself and what your strengths, <laughs> what are your superpowers? Um, so that's mm -hmm. that's that's powerful. Has there ever been a mentor? I know Tyler. I I, I prop Tyler up often because I needed him to to help me. Um, is there a particular person, Jeff, throughout your life, throughout your career, that was able to help you identify some of those strengths and what brought, I guess, in your self discovery of what your passion truly was? Uh <laughs> I, you know, not really in the workplace, um, but but if I had to pick anybody, I'd probably pick my father. Um, my father, unlike me, is a quieter guy, kind of shy, kind of reserved. He 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 was, you know, he um, repaired mailing machines for a living and and did things like that. But everything my dad ever did, he was like, if he bothered to do it, he did it right. And sometimes he didn't say a lot of stuff, but if he said something. It had a lot of power to it. My dad ever yelled, which he never did growing up. Um, and he said something. It was more than like a chapter from my mom, right? <laughs> like it, it it just had a more powerful uh, impact. And I think that he had the hardest working ethic of anybody I've ever met in my life. And he could just roll with things that didn't go right in life. And he never was bitter about what he didn't have or what didn't happen. He just wanted to... To, to move forward and didn't didn't get obsessed with the things that eat other people up. So I would say him. <clears throat> a natural outlaw of Josie Wells, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. Man. Well, Jeff, I, I, you, you brought up the uh, my favorite subject, the okay. stuff you stink at. Yeah. What what do you stink at? Uh, um I stink at nitty, ditty, nitty gritty details, right? Like I love, <laughs> I'm a big picture guy. I want to, <clears throat> I want to blaze things out. I do know that if you never finish a job, if you never complete something that you're in a bad place. So I know that you have to do those details, but like in my home, right? I'll, I'll renovate an entire room. I'll, I'll gut it. I'll drywall it. I'll, I'll wire it. I've done all these things. Right. And then I got to put just the molding around the bottom and that'll sit there for four months because I don't want to finish the very last thing in the job because it's not interesting anymore. I'm ready to move on, right? So I stink at that. And uh, I'd say I also stink at um, um, uh, ceremonial public speaking. I don't like speaking in front of a giant room of people uh, for fluff. If, if I've got to give somebody an award because they've done something truly as a champion, I love it. But if I'm up there pandering to a crowd, that, that, that's that's the nails on the chalkboard to me. It makes me physically uncomfortable. Uh, and, and I kind of hurt. And, and it's funny, if I'm training a group of people, like I could stand in front of a group of new employees and train them, that feels great. If I'm honoring somebody for 15 years of service, that feels great. But if I'm up there, you know, I don't know, given... Something I've, I'm not really into and trying to sell it to a crowd of people. It's not who I am. It's not my way. I, I, I'm much more comfortable, uh, you know, I don't know. I think you've, you get the idea. Do you thrive in a team? Is it hard for you to be that 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 one person? Do you know? Because I do. I, I, I struggle with the eyes, right? And any time yeah. that I feel like I'm talking about myself, I feel like I'm coming over as braggadocious or egotistical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I don't have somebody to highlight, support, enable, empower, um, and encourage, 
I don't, I, I feel uncomfortable. Um, is that, is that kind of what you, you're feeling is that you don't have the opportunity to, it's really the Jeff show at that point. Yeah. 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 Uh, I've never been one to take a compliment very well. I, 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 I'll deflect it or I'll shut it down or I'll think someone had other motives. Oh, they're just saying that. So I will do this or, you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I don't, I, um, I don't want it to be all about me unless I choose to have it be all about me, right? <laughs> like, the, but the, the, you know, so I, I don't like birthdays, same thing, right? The spotlight's on you and you don't necessarily want to. Nothing so your wedding must have been as tough as mine. My, my, what I was like, wait a minute, everybody's going to be wanting to talk to me all day. I, yeah. this makes me feel very uncomfortable. <laughs> you know I, I actually really enjoyed my wedding because uh, my wife was one of those, like, she was born and ready to be married kind of thing. And this was like her day. So yeah. I could play my part on her day. And it was fine. And I had a blast my whole, you know, and some things went wrong. There was three inches of rain that fell that day and it never stopped raining. And <laughs> there were like things that went wrong. I didn't care. It, yeah. it was because, you know, it went well. Can I ask, a, 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 I guess it's going to be a, maybe a more personal question, but why are we so bad at taking compliments? I don't know. Maybe it's um, the, the right kind of self-esteem isn't there, or um, or maybe it's that there's a, you know, there's always a piece of you inside that doubts, you know, sometimes. Exactly. I, I, I think you feel like you're a fraud inside sometimes. Like yeah. like every once in a while, I'm thinking, well, geez, I should still be working direct care in a group home somewhere. How am I running a $40 million agency with a thousand <laughs> employees? Like, who let me do this? And someone's going to figure out it's all a house of cards or something. So <laughs> That so, imposter so, syndrome. But but you don't want to, you know, so so I guess it might be rooted in something like that. Um and and the types of compliments I receive well are things that I absolutely am clear in my mind I've got down right. So told you I like I I just renovated my um, powder room in my house and it looked good when it was done. Someone can look at that and say you did a good job, Jeff. And I'm like, thank you, I did do a good job. But <laughs> if someone tells me like I'm a good leader, um, I think it's it's a much harder thing because I look at examples of people in the community that I think are good leaders. And I don't think that I'm as good as they are at it. And and so it's it's hard to take, or I, yeah. I diminish the, that compliment a little bit. Yeah. It's, that, it's that same ad, old adage that uh, it's that com comparison game. I think it'll yeah. continue, continue to compare. And if we don't feel like we, we're in that same boat, it, that's where that imposter syndrome starts to creep in. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely, at least for me. And it sounds like for yeah. yourself. Who are a few leaders you look up to around around your community, Jeff? Who are your top three up in the five eight five? Um, so I would say uh, I'm a, of a human service agency. I'm very impressed with uh, Emery Cook at Lifespan. I think she is as close to a complete leader as there is. She's sociable. She's intelligent. She runs a good agency. She's political. She's diplomatic when she needs to be. Everybody likes her. She's very successful at what she does. So she's a great example of a nonprofit leader. Um, I think that uh, I've been pretty impressed with the mayor of the city of Rochester. I think that he's been kind of a breath of fresh air. I think that he um, he says it like he sees it. And sometimes you're watching him on TV and you're like, should he have said that? And I'm like, yeah, great. Like, because I think he's being kind of true to himself. Yeah. Um, uh, and then, um, um, you know, Corporate leaders and, and people in the community, uh, I, I'm impressed with a lot of the corporate leaders, particularly the ones that that are very civic minded in what they do. The, you know, the Galenas come to mind or, the, you know, people that that um, um, they they they're successful in what they do as a business, but they also feel like they owe something back to the community and they want to take care of and, and, and be a good steward. And, you know, we have a lot of our board members that are like that. They don't need to be doing what they're doing and they're choosing to do it uh, because they're trying to give more purpose and meaning in their life while, while giving back to, to a world that's been pretty good to them. I love it. And you, you read any good books right now, Jeff? I'm just, I'm just, I need to pick your brain at all this. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I think the book is called, I'm reading a book right now called, I think it's called 22 minutes. Uh, it, it's about a local, um, guy who is a racing sailor who was on a ship in world war II that got, uh, sunk in the Pacific by the Japanese. So I'm reading that right now. 
Um, the last book I read was one called The Devil in the White City, which juxtaposes um, um, a serial killer at the Chicago World's Fair. So it, it's World's Fair story. And then the serial killer who is the, no relation to the to the people who started the fair, but just these two stories and, and how they floated. So uh, I, I tend to gravitate towards uh, nonfiction. And um, I studied history in my four-year degree in college. So I, I tend to, to love things that are historical and tell a little bit different tale of, you know, I've, I've recently read a book uh, about uh, Olmsted and, and before he developed all those beautiful parks, he, he did these tours of the South uh, around the Civil War and was reporting back. And this guy in modern day now went and retraced his route. And so what used to be a, a frontier town is now a rusted out steel town or something like that. And then he sees drugs and crime and it juxtaposes the two together. So that's the kind of stuff I like reading. Cool. Very cool. Keeps you, keeps you, <laughs> keeps it, keeps every day interesting. It sounds yeah. like and and history is, is always something of interest because um, those writing the the books of history. Yeah. Usually, usually it's, it, you do need some of that outside perspective and some of yeah. those other stories. I wanted to go back to, cause we're talking about reading and you talked about storytelling, mm -hmm. just the importance of storytelling internally to your own employees yeah. Um, to kind of share that you have that perspective um, of some of the jobs that they're currently working. You mentioned, yeah. I can still smell it. I can still remember yeah. getting up in the morning. I know you shared in the or earlier conversations that you and I have had. How do you share your story of where you came from as almost an ability to share with others within the organization that they too have a chance in leadership at EPI? I, I try to get in front of the staff that are here. So, uh, you know, like in the last year, I went to every single staff meeting in the agency. There's about 30 different staff meetings and went to them. And I and I went there to talk about value-based culture and the values we're emphasizing in the agency. But it, inevitably, I give a little bit of a sketch of like who I am and where I came from. And, and um, you know, and, and I'll often get questions asked like, well, what did you think it was like when you're a DSP? And 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 I and I'll say things like, Well, I always remember sitting in your seat, wonder looking and going, Those idiots don't know what's going on. They don't know what it's like <laughs> down here in the trenches. They've got no clue, you know. And 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 you always get a great rise when when you say that and then and then can follow it up with, you know, but I I, I had the benefit and the beauty of working my way through organizations and got to see the the entry level positions and the middle management and, and the top and 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 the grass is always greener on the other side right wherever you're looking they've got it easier than you and 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 but but you know um when you can see the whole picture it makes it come together better and and usually try to use that as a way to get employees to see more of the organization, right? So if you have someone who's working overnights in a group home, it's a pretty isolating job, right? You might work with one other person or see a few people in the morning, but you're pretty removed from the structure of the agency and and, and the other departments. So what if you could get that individual to join um, an engagement, an employee engagement committee or a recognition committee, or or you could get them plugged in on a, a, a an, an abuse uh, committee or a informed consent committee or something that the agency does so that it draws them in and they get to meet people and, oh, you've got IT people that work here and finance people that work here. And these are what their jobs are like and whatever to, to just see more of the workings of the organization. I think some of the happiest employees we have are ones that really have that 10,000 foot view of who we are and what we do. And, and the people that can't see it, um, you want them to see more of, of what it is. So they, you know, because you don't want it to just, you think of someone working in a stock room in a Walmart or something, and it's like you against the machine kind of thing. And, and you don't want people to feel that way. Big time, big time. Yeah. And, I, and I think the 10,000 foot view also, uh, if their current role that they're not in um, is not aligned with their strengths or their passion, since they've been able to identify that over the last call it 18 months, they now know other opportunities that exist within the same organization. Uh, I think yeah. to your point, we we look for greener pastures, even though there's probably a similar role within that organization, but we're afraid to ask for fear of retribution. And I think the other fear is that some of the environments that I've worked in, and, and it seems, and it takes a lot of building of trust, but um, you even to get the manager to approve that 
uh, individual to move to a different department. Because sometimes that manager then knows, now I have to backfill that position, retrain. So it's easier for me just to keep that person, even though they're miserable where they're at. How yeah. do you get your team comfortable with that saying, hey, if it's not a fit and it's not, it's it doesn't work, we have yeah. 29 other departments that we we should be exposing this individual to. Yeah. So, so, you know, what you're saying, I think this is one thing I think we've successfully not conquered, but we've we've really like years back, we were looking at this because you used to have that. You'd have a, a manager, a supervisor had a shining star under them and they'd kind of protect them or hide them from other people's view because they didn't want to lose that great employee. And I think, again, particularly by the time we got into the pandemic, uh, you just realized that staff resources are so precious. And if somebody's even remotely bored or disinterested in their job or they've been there, done that, they're looking elsewhere and they're not going to stay. And I think that, you know, we, we have a pretty good collective um, viewpoint here definitely with upper and middle management, that it is better to keep that talent here within the agency than to let them go. And, and when you see somebody, or sometimes you see someone that seems like a high potential person, right? You're really excited and you bring them in and they seem to be struggling. Again, probably 30 years ago, I'd be like, well, you're not getting it done. You shouldn't be here. Now it's about finding that right fit, right? So, um, you know, you seem to be really strong with this. And maybe instead of working with this type of a, a population or in this type of a job, why don't you try this other thing, which is much more in line with how you're presenting to us. So um, it, it, it's a great way to, 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 again, instead of blaming the employee for not fitting in the role, it's, it's about working with them to find, do you have a fit? And at least if you don't have a fit and they go, you can feel good that you treated them well and you gave them a fair shot, right? Like it doesn't work with everybody and sometimes they go, but I don't want anyone leaving, not thinking they weren't that they didn't get a chance, that they didn't get to see, that all we were was this one little job or role that they were seeing. You want them to see more of what's here. But I think that's leadership at the end of the day of what you said because of what we were talking about earlier with that imposter syndrome. Yeah. That they're feeling the same exact way, They just like I was. I think we're trained to focus more on our weaknesses than we are our strengths. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, Tyler helped me identify what my strengths were and what those superpowers are so then I could know where what was more in alignment of. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know if we're not taking the time in, personally or individually to reflect and take that time or just surrounding ourselves with the wrong people because um, Tyler and I talk about the social board of directors yeah. as well. But fascinating. Appreciate it. Yeah, this is easy, man. Jeff, so, so you're, you're definitely at the top of your game, I'd say. You know, how, when did you know you were going to be a president of a company? Was it, how, yeah, tell us that because, I'm waiting to know myself. Yeah, I, I, I'm still in disbelief about it. So I'll tell you when I get there. Um, I, you know, it, it, it's funny. So, I, I, you know, the, the, the line I give everybody is I got in this field by accident, but I stay on purpose, right? And and mm -hmm. so I, I start working direct support jobs, day programs, group homes, got a series of of these uh, um, promotions. I was an assistant supervisor, a supervisor, I was a service coordinator, became a program director, and probably for a decade, I'm in this field. And I'm thinking, and I said, well, this is what I'm doing until I get my real job. And, huh. and I had this kind of epiphany one day, and I don't know why, it was no, nothing happened. I just remember at my old job, just sitting at my desk one day and going, you know, you talk quite a game about going out to find something different, but you're not doing anything about it. Why aren't you doing anything about it? You know what? This is what you do for a living. This is where you belong. This is wow. the kind of thing. And then really got reflecting on, well, why haven't I left? And I, I think it's tied to, I, I went to high school with, a, with a, my friends in high school. Many of them became quite successful. They, they, they went on, they made big money. They got big jobs. They went to Ivy League schools. They left the area. They, they did all this stuff. And here was Jeff making six bucks an hour working as a DSP, right? And I always felt very self-conscious about, uh, because I was gonna be a teacher or something, even that probably wasn't good enough for a lot, a lot of what they did. And so, so I guess I had it in my head that I was just supposed to do something different, but I didn't leave on purpose and there was stuff to do. And, and I think when I had that epiphany, um, it was not long after that, I start volunteering for extra duties and tasks. I start running grants on top of my job. I start doing some different things. And, and really, it was within a year that I was promoted into a, a director's position. 
Um, and then to be a president, I never wanted to be a president. Once I committed to this is the field, then I said, well, what's my perfect job? Well, I'm an operations guy at heart. I, 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 I want to do the service stuff. I don't want to lobby. I don't want to fundraise. I want to I want to provide services to people that need them, right? So the dream job to me was like the vice president of operations at a large agency, something like a People Inc. out in Buffalo, like a big agency. That was my dream job. And and one day um, I was sitting and talking with the, the, the CEO at my last job and he, he had had cancer and he was struggling with it and he was getting ready to leave. And and he just made this comment. He goes, well, obviously you'll be running an agency someday. And he goes, and he goes, well, in this agency here, which is Prelid, which is the root agency I went to, he, he said, well, they've got a CEO job open. So I, I, I walked out of his office going, is he trying to figure out whether I'm trying to leave or is he trying to tell me I should leave? <laughs> I applied, I applied to the job, right? And, and I go in thinking, well, at very least, I need to get practicing interviewing. I need to get my resume together. So I figured it would be a great exercise. They give me an interview, and I go in the interview, and I go, well, I don't really want this job. I'm just going <laughs> I, I to be brutally honest, right? And I'm going to be, I'm not, no errors. So I go in, and one of the former board members asked me a question right in the beginning and saying, well, what do you know about this agency? So I start talking about a headline worthy thing that had gone wrong the year before and a, and a fine that had come from the attorney general's office. And, and I see this look of horror on all their face. And I'm like, well, I'm never coming back. In here again. <laughs> but they invite me back again. And I do a second interview. The third interview, they, 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 they well, so, so they do two interviews and then they invite me to Locust Hill Country Club. Now, I'm again, I'm a jeans and t-shirt kind of person. I've set foot in a country club like three times in my life. They invite me out to Locust Hill. I go, oh, they're gonna, they're gonna offer me a job. Well, I'll see what they're gonna offer, right? So I go out there, we have cocktails. We sit down in a private room for dinner and the board chair's tapping this folder with his fingers through the whole thing. And I'm like, well, there's an offer letter in there. <laughs> What's out, right? What's in and that we get there at five o'clock and it's seven o'clock and nine o'clock and 10 o'clock. And then all of a sudden he just looks at me and goes, okay, Jeff, good night. And I walk out and I get in my car and I'm like, that was a character interview. They wanted to see if I could be sophisticated. And, and I'm driving home and I'm like, why? And that created this whole other level of fascination. So I'm sitting in my office the next day, which is a Friday morning. And in and casual Friday, I'm wearing jeans and like a pullover and whatever. Guy in a three-piece suit comes to my office, walks in past all my staff. I've got 30 staff, walks through all their cubicles, comes, knocks on my door unannounced with a, with a job offer. Oh, uh, and so then I asked for an outrageously higher amount and they gave it to me. So I'm like, okay, I guess I'm an executive director. So wow. I, I, I still thought I would do it for a couple of years and then become a chief operating officer somewhere. But but the agency has grown and, and evolved so much. And it's really allowed me to grow and evolve. And, you know, every couple times a year, I get a ping from a, from a recruiter or something, and they're looking for me to do something else. And, and, and I'm like, I, I think I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. You know, even though in some of these, my brain tells me, you know, you could retire a lot better if you, but, but I, I think I found a place that's aligned with who I am and vice versa. I think it was already the way I am wired yeah. And I think I've got the good fortune of coming to a place that philosophically looked like me and felt oh. like me. Uh, so it was easy to be able to pick up the mantle and, and run with it uh, after I got here. Oh, so many things that you said that uh, I'd love to pull out because I think the definition that you had of a real job was defi yeah. still defined yeah. by others and yep. us comparing because we all do it once you graduate. Um, yeah. but how, how few people say I got in by accident, but I stay on purpose, uh, because <laughs> you talk to so many people that get their college degree and very rarely are they anywhere close in, in actuality to anything that they actually learned in college. Um, and a lot of people just have more of a crooked mile story or journey than, than, than yeah. I think we realize. I think we see it so black and white, like you said, mm -hmm. until we share some of these stories yeah. and these experiences to your point where, it is taking the bull by the horns. If you know, I all I all I heard you say is once you identified that this was a passion for you, then you started to do the extra things by the stretch goals and volunteering for more tasks because it was a passion and you knew over time that they would probably see 
that you were investing in in the business, but also yourself. Um, at the same time. And and I think that that can only come with passion. If it feels like work, no one is going to sign up for more training and development for work. Um, yeah. but if it's a passion and, it, and and we focus on the outcome or that shared success, um, I think that's really where people are starting to, to, to feel inspired uh, again, mm -hmm. um, to, mm -hmm. to get to that continuous learning environment that I know you guys are building over at EPI. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I wanted to go back uh, to, 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 I guess, ask um, is kind of talking about um, the difference between mentorship and sponsorship. Um, it sounds like you've had both mentors and sponsors throughout your career. What was most beneficial to your success? You know, I, I guess I don't even think of it in those terms. I, I, I look at it that, um, you know, I didn't have somebody lift me up a ton, but I had a lot of people that opened one more door, made one more introduction, something that allowed me to step through and 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 capitalize on the opportunity, right? So, uh, you know, maybe uh, it, it, it's, um, I'm the collective of a lot of people's little gestures and thoughts and help and assist and and, and those things. So I, I guess I don't even think of it in those terms of, of you know, I, I, I don't, I, I feel like there've been parts of time in my life where I thought I need a mentor, but have never, identified anybody as a mentor but i don't think i've needed a mentor i've just needed you know it what's uh hillary clinton's book there right it takes a village right yeah. it, it was just a bunch of it was a bunch of little things from a lot of different people that meant way more to me than they probably would ever know and 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 gave me opportunities or allowed me to you know to 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 achieve beyond my mistakes and problems and things that i'm not very good at my baby's crying in the back as well. I got a, a <laughs> and and I, I'm eating sunflower seeds to stay awake. I've had a blast with you, Jeff. I, I Next time I come and visit Kevin, I hope sometime um, up in the Flower City, um, maybe go and get uh, some White Hots is what I miss the most, I think. <laughs> Where are you now? Uh, uh, Northeast Dallas, like oh, out okay. here in super suburbia. But uh, oh. my neighbor actually has some White Hots, guys. <laughs> oh, my Zweigels. gosh. Well, I'll fly. I'll, <laughs> I'll send some Zweigels down. We'll, we'll send some Zweigels down. Freeze. We'll, we'll dry freeze them. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. And you also meet the uh, Miss the Delis. Uh, uh, Jeff, uh, Tyler's vying for uh, a meal. So a meals might be where you and I have to go get a sub because Tyler just keeps telling me from Texas how great it is. And it's a sub at meals, right? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I food, love a good food, the, hot, the hot peppers or yeah. Like, Freaking perfect over there, man. I was there like eight days a week in Victor. I was like, I'm back, guys. They're like, do you ever go anywhere else? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> uh, I know what I like. I had a blast. Just nice to meet you. This has been awesome. And I really, I think this is uh, the last question I want to ask you is from your experience, um, from your learned experience, your lived experience, um, sounds like you learn from, from hearing other stories, um, especially on your team. What would you tell um, the audience as to some of your keys to success and leadership today? As you have evolved, what have you found to be some of the keys to success in, in, in today's leadership in today's world? I would say be authentic, uh, uh, be who you are, be yourself. Uh, I think you should be transparent. You should tell people what your goals or objectives are whenever you can. I think you should, people deserve honest feedback about how they're doing. And we don't always want to give it, but we should give it. And I think that we should own the things that we're not very good at and, and acknowledge to your team, like, you know, I, yeah, this has never been my strength, but here's how we're going to try and work through it or, or do that. Um, uh, you, you know, I think th those things can get you quite a ways. I, I, you know, I don't think it'll get you all the way, but I think it can get you quite a way. Uh, and, and I think if you've got a team that believes in you and, um, wants to work with you and, and is on board with where you're doing, uh, you're going to have rough spots and you're going to, going to screw some stuff up along the way, but you can get it done. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, and it, I just love how you're focusing really on being vulnerable, being authentic. It's really on the, the building the trust so you can establish a relationship or a social bond with, and, and yeah. kind of speaks to, I think just the creation of, of your business plan where the first two pillars of the entire business plan were, were people oriented. Yeah. Um, Jeff, I just want to pause, say thank you um, for your leadership. Um, I think this type of leadership is needed in Rochester. 
um, because I think that you see the impact that you're having not only on your employees' life and, and, and their day, but also the marginalized disabled population as you guys continue to work hard uh, to educate the market on, mm -hmm. hey, look at our unemployment, unemployment numbers from the disabled community, excuse me, um, and what opportunities are there? How can we work together to, to really solve the problems that we're all experiencing? How can we put our minds together to really find opportunities to, to so we can all have that same um, success or shared success. Um, so thank you uh, for your leadership. Thanks for taking out the time to join Tyler and I's crazy show and share a little bit more about you, your story, um, but especially about uh, the passion that you have for the work that you're doing. Um, so thank you, Jeff, for, for being a, a special guest on Time Out with Leaders. All right. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin.